everyone. Good morning. Welcome, welcome to this first course live session. I'm Frederick and I'm very, really excited to be here with our expert today to talk about the biodiversity crisis. This is an interactive live session, so you are very welcome to ask your question directly below the video. Our expert will answer you during the live. The evidence of global biodiversity loss is overwhelming, unfortunately. There is a growing concern about the rapidity, rapidly declining variety of life on Earth. Remember, according to the Davos Forum's annual report on global risk, the disappearance of natural capital is the second major risk we will face in the next 10 years. Insurance and reinsurance are directly exposed to this risk. For the first time, the French Museum National d'Histoire Naturelle and SCORE Foundation for Science publish of a scientific report entitled Biodiversity and Reinsurance and Ecosystem at Risk. This is the first large scale study on this issue. So let me raise some of the few questions that we will try to answer today with our panel. Do we really know what biodiversity means? Why are we focusing more on climate change and much less on biodiversity loss? How can we manage the risk linked to the loss of biodiversity? And how can we build a more resilient society? To discuss this issue, we will be joined today by Jules Chandelier, project leader of the report that led to the publication of the book Des risques grandeur nature, comment l'extinction du vivant met en péril nos sociétés aux éditions Le Pommier, how, in another word, how the extension of life is endangering our societies. Hello, Jules. Good morning, Frédéric. Good morning. Michel Lacroix, Michel, Group Head of Sustainability. Hello, Michel. Good morning, Frédéric. And Bruno Latourette, Chief Knowledge Officer. Hello, Bruno. Good morning, Frédéric. And remotely from uh, England, Paul Noon, Head of Sustainable Insurance. Hi, Paul, how are you? Hello, Frédéric, very well, thank you. Okay, so let's start the discussion with uh, Jules Cotter of the excellent book, this excellent book, uh, Des Risques Grandeur Nature, with Marine Malakin, who couldn't be here today. Jules, tell us first, what exactly are we talking about when we speak about biodiversity. Yes, um, so the term biodiversity comes from the two words biological and diversity, and it refers to all the forms of living organisms on Earth, which constitute the web of life. Okay. Um, and it is really important to talk about di biodiversity because um, what is really critical to understand and to keep in mind is that all living beings are interconnected and interdependent through ecological functions, including human beings. Yeah, it's the reason why it's so important for us. Exactly, um, because this means that humans are dependent on the existent biodiversity through what we can call ecosystem services. And these ecosystem services are all the goods and services that people obtain from nature. And there are three types of these ecosystem services. Um, the regulating services, which are all the services that regulates the environment, such as pollination, habitat creation, or regulation of air or water. Um, there are the material services, which provides us with food, with feed, or even with medicines. Mm -hmm. And um, the last one is non-material services, which are um, the spirituality, the inspiration, or the learning experience that we can take uh, from nature. So three level, two independent level of uh, diversity. Yes. 
So um, these are three uh, different uh, types of uh, ecosystem mm -hmm. services. If, okay. if I take uh, an example, if we take the example of insect pollinators, um, such as bees, which is a type of living being, they participate in pollination, which is a regulating service. Okay. Um, they pollinate plants, another type of living being, so we can see the interconnection and interdependence. And plants, well, through pollination, they will possibly grow food for us humans. So this is a material service and food can be a source of inspiration or cultural spirituality, which is a non-material service. Okay, so you said also that biodiversity is rapidly degra degrading to the point that scientists consider that the sex mass extension has begun. What are the different pieces of evidence uh, put forward by the community? Yes, the community? Um, yes, exactly. So you might have heard about the IPCC and its report on climate uh, uh, just before the COP21 in 2014. So the IPBS is um, often referred as the equivalent of the IPCC, but for biodiversity. And they have published their for first global assessment in 2019, which compiles more than 15,000 scientific paper on the matter and which gives us an overall evaluation of the state of biodiversity and um, ecosystem services and the scientific message um, the conclusions are loud and clear we have biodiversity is degrading at an unprecedented and alarming rate from tens to hundred times higher than it has averaged in the past 10 million years mm -hmm. and the indicators used by scientists um, show an overwhelmingly net decline mm -hmm. over the past decade one example maybe of, of these um, indicators yeah, sure. is the Living Planet Index, mm -hmm. um, which um, shows us that in the past 50 years, um, on average, uh, there has been a decrease of 68% of population of vertebrates wow. globally. Wow. Okay. Okay. But frankly speaking, reading your book, the one thing that jumps <coughs> to mind in that uh, biodiversity is such a complex issue. Well, there are many unknowns and ramifications when a natural ecosystem is impacted. Would you have an illustration of, of that? Yes, um, sure. So I can, I can take a, an illustration under the sea with, uh, for instance, coral reefs. Okay. Um, so we've actually lost half of coral reefs covers since the late 19th century. And um, coral reefs um, are really essential uh, because they support the development of fisheries, but they're also a critical protection against um, uh, extreme events and coastal erosion. So in a sense, they protect also land on, uh, life on land. Okay. And they're also a major source of income for tourism, for coastal populations. So we can see that one, um, one set of living beings are useful at a lot of different uh, levels. Yeah, I see you nodding. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly, if I may, Frédéric, yeah, there, there is also a very good example in, um, in Jules' book around the vulture. Okay. And so in the late 90s in India, mm -hmm. uh, we uh, looked at the, uh, at least they, they realized that there was a, a big disparation of the vulture, of three vulture species. Uh, we went from about 10 million to about uh, 100,000, a bit less than 100,000 over 10 years. Okay. So that was a massive uh, extinction. Uh, there was also a famous uh, UK uh, biologist that mentioned that that was unheard of in history. And so they tried to understand why. And uh, at the beginning, they thought it might have been a virus, but they didn't find a virus. And then uh, uh, they realized that the major cause was coming from uh, Dicoflinac, Dicoflinac yeah, which is a, really? an anti-inflammatory drug. Yeah. Uh, I know. I know that. Okay, that, that, that was given to the cows to manage their recovery of fever of pain. And as you know, in India, uh, the cows are not being eaten. And so there is a lot of uneaten carcasses uh, that are usually eaten by the vulture. Okay. And they realize that the diclofenac is fatal to vulture. And that was explaining the disparition of those, of those vultures. And so those carcasses were uneaten. There was a breeding ground for bacteria, 
that led to some of the pollution of the soil, that led to some uh, disease uh, issues. It, was also, it also led to a few other scave scavenger, mm -hmm. namely uh, the dogs or the rats that hit a bit the, uh, the carcasses. Okay. And as you know, uh, uh, the rats are also a, a, a conveyor of lots of uh, illness. I mean, the, the plague is one that we all have in mind. And so this is increasing the risk of this uh, uh, appearing. And on the dog side, uh, uh, in 2007, uh, India uh, was a world leader from uh, death by rabies. And about two thirds of the rabies uh, are coming from uh, dog bites. So this increase in dogs uh, led to a lot of implication on the, on the human health. So I think it's a very good example of how our action uh, yeah. could uh, have uh, an impact on the, on the, and a real impact on the human health that was unforeseen. It's incredible, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I was smiling because I had a, a twist recently and uh, I know the Dikufenak and I felt very, uh, felt now very guilty <laughs> about that. So uh, another thing, everyone is concerned about uh, climate change. So uh, uh, that's hopefully, but not so much about uh, bio, biodiversity. Uh, why, is, why is that? How comes? Well, actually, there's a lot of um, parallel that can be drawn between um, climate change and biodiversity. And um, in these recent years, we've been experiencing a bit of the same um, period that we've experienced with uh, climate change, um, with the pub publication of the IPCC report in 2014 between the, uh, before the COP21 yeah. in, in Paris. And today we have a bit of um, a similar momentum around biodiversity with the publication of the IPBS report just before the COP15 on uh, biodiversity uh, in, in a few months. And Michel. so, so um, yeah, in the past two, three years, we've seen a growing interest from all stakeholders and a lot of commitments, which are, uh, which we see as very positive. But of course, um, biodiversity might be more challenging uh, to problem to tackle, especially because we lack some easy and uh, single indicator to talk about uh, biodiversity. And um, yeah, we lack some easy indicators compared to climate change, with which we have the ton of uh, ton of carbon and a plus two degree target. But biodiversity compared to climate change is multidimensional. So I talked about the Living Planet Index, which is about population, but yeah. we need to talk about species, about community distribution, composition, about habitats. And it is virtually impossible to compute a single index um, which would cover all uh, aspects of biodiversity. This is why it takes a bit more time, I guess, to uh, embrace this problem. Mm, okay, um, just uh, to about, about climate change and uh, I have an, another some, something in, in mind. Uh, do you think is it because uh, uh, there are not so, so no simple tools to measure our dependence on uh, biodiversity, like the ton of CO2 uh, for the claim climate? Do you think uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that is the reason? Uh, Maybe one word on this. I think it's not only a question of tool. Some tools are starting to emerge, uh, at least for the financial system. Uh, what is missing, as, uh, as Jules said, is really a metric. Uh, it's very tough for us to assess the price of biodiversity loss. Okay. Measuring carbon emission is much easier. Uh, putting a price uh, on the, uh, the, the, the ton of CO2 is something which is doable. Uh, as of today, honestly, assessing the price of this biodiversity loss and how it can impact our business model is very complex. Mm -hmm. And we need to consider biodiversity from the double materiality lens, I see. which is something which is really important. Biodiversity loss can impact negatively business models and that's the outside in uh, or the financial impact that is considered. But we also have to take into account, and that is the most important for financial markets, we have to take into account the impact of our activities on biodiversity. That's what is called the inside out aspect. Okay. And it's really not, uh, 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 biodiversity is multidimensional, but adding this double lens 
dimension to tackling biodiversity loss is really something which is difficult. Being able to disentangle what we try to do for protecting our portfolios, our investment portfolios, versus what we are trying to do to have positive impact and to reverse biodiversity loss by our investment decision, it's really difficult to make sure that we understand what we try to do, we get the right tool, and as we don't have any metric, steering a portfolio with no metric is quite tough. I understand. I see. Well, we're very, very interesting. Another point interesting in your report is you talk about global warming and biodiversity loss as twin crisis. Yes. Yes, exactly. What do you mean? It's, it's um, crucial to understand that um, climate change and biodiversity are intertwined in the sense that on one hand, climate change is one of the five main drivers of biodiversity loss. And on the other hand, um, biodiversity loss is an aggravating factor of climate change. And an easy illustration of that is uh, deforestation. Okay, so let's turn now with, uh, to our expert. Just one yeah. comment on this deforestation. Michelle. If people don't understand the, the link, one of, of the action that is taken uh, in the uh, decarbonation of the economy is to say you reduce carbon emission yeah. and then you offset. And how do you offset by planting trees? Then the next question is, before planting new trees, why don't we work on halting deforestation? Right. And it's the gate to biodiversity. At least that's the way SCORE has uh, assessed it in its investment portfolio. We started from GHG emission and from the climate crisis, and then we opened the gate to biodiversity through this deforestation topic. Yes. I see. And to, to just conclude on this, it's very important for us to, um, that we need to understand that um, taking measures on one of these environmental issues, uh, if the other one is not taken into account, it can have global detrimental environmental impacts. So, as it's said in the IPBS, no climate action can be done at the expense of biodiversity. Okay. So we need to uh, tackle these two problems, two very different problems, but with an integrated approach. I see, I see. Well, interesting. So what are precisely the risks uh, uh, associated with the decline of biodiversity? In, we... term in terms of our investments, um, it's difficult to know which are the most uh, impacting factors. Uh, biodiversity is so broad and covers so many topics. So uh, we have, as, uh, as investors, we have uh, the ability to rely on preliminary tools. And one which is quite important is the ENCORE tool, Explore Natural Capital Opportunity Risk and Exposures. Uh, this tool enables us to identify uh, the sectors that are most at risk with regards to biodiversity in its two dimensions. It deals with um, impacts of, our, uh, of these uh, sectors on biodiversity, but also the dependency of the sector on biodiversity. Okay. Once you have that, you can map your portfolio. It's really high level type of assessment, but you can isolate within your portfolio, for instance, the most exposed to deforestation. It's not enough to measure. It's not enough to, to manage, but it's enough to start acting, to start engaging with companies, and to st start trying to better understand how those companies deal with biodiversity, how aware they are of this topic. It's not always the case. The most exposed are not always the most aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And it's a, also a way for you to, to start and act, teach them, uh, uh, make them much more aware of the situation. Finally, the big deal with biodiversity when trying to include it in your investment decision is the data challenge, mm -hmm. because nobody knows which, which data we need to be able to steer. And even if we knew which one we would need, uh, it's impossible how, now to get all the information for all the investees. Yeah. So it's, mm. it's really, mm. 
it's tough to, yeah. to, to understand biodiversity, it's tough to apply it mm. to investment portfolio, right. but right. on a more optimistic uh, mm. stance, uh, there are a lot of initiatives yeah. that are going on to make sure that we collectively try to find methodologies, we collectively try to to assess in the same way, and we collectively talk to companies to make sure that they make the progress that are needed yeah. for us to have this data, to understand their business model, and to reallocate our portfolio if need be. Okay, okay. So I'm told that uh, we already have questions from uh, the audience. <coughs> Um, so, is biodiversity a global issue in the same way as climate change or are more, most bio, biodiversity related problems more local concern? Who wants to answer the question? I can, I can try to answer quite quickly. So, as I said, um, biodiversity um, is an aggravating factor of, of climate change and so both challenges are really intertwined, so um, harmful impacts on biodiversity will have impacts on, on climate change, so it will have global impacts in the end. Um, and also biodiversity, as I said at the beginning, um, what is really important is the interconnection and interdependence between living beings. So, um, of course, biodiversity might be also more complicated in climate change because we need to look at it at the local, very local level in mm -hmm. terms of population, species and, and communities. So it's much more of a local problem. But um, what is critical here is that it can have a really global impacts and consequences. Okay, I see. So again, feel free to ask your question uh, on, on, on the live and uh, don't and hesitate. Maybe, maybe I can jump into, into, into this issue because we, we, um, we are living in a pandemic world at the moment. Yes, right? we know. Mm. And, uh, and what we've seen is that uh, at least over the past uh, what, 50 years, 70% of the pandemics that we had were coming from a, a jump from an animal to a human. And so the connection between the human and the animal, and the more you have connection and the more likely you are going to have a pandemic and what we've seen at least that the pandemic could spread and be a move from a local Chinese right. issue to a, to a major global one. Um, the, the, the example of those jump between animal and human, I mean, they are very, I mean, it's still, we, we don't know fully yet on COVID, but at least on the HIV, on Ebola, it, they, they are very clear. There's a, there's a nice example in um, in 98, with the Nipah virus, which is uh, an outbreak that took place in Malaysia. Okay. For, for those of you that don't know the Nipah virus, it's a bit like the Ebola virus, but instead of attacking some of the blood vessels, it, it attacks the brain. So, and it's very deadly. Mm -hmm. And what we see is that the, um, the, it came from the fruit bats that were uh, nicely living in their forest, but there were some uh, fire that you, the human put to expand, uh, to, uh, in particular to put some uh, pork farms. And therefore, the, the fruit bats went and lived in the pork farm instead of their forest, infected the porks, we infected uh, thereafter the human. So that's, this connection is very important to, to bear in mind. And unfortunately, with all the connections that we have in our world, uh, a local problem is becoming uh, soon a, a global one. Okay, okay. So, well, so the, the impact, I would like to return to the impact of this loss uh, in um, different uh, sectors. So I, I, I guess uh, according to the sectors in which uh, SCO operates, it's, uh, the impact is also, of course uh, different. Uh, and uh, I would uh, like to know what the potential impact uh, of this risk uh, on PNC. Maybe Paul can answer the question. Thank oh. you, Frederick. Yes. Do you, are you Hi. with us? I am. Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Um, on on PNC, on the PNC a... side. Please, we have a sound problem here. <laughs> sound problem. We can't. Um... Do, you, do you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, oh, well. Ah. So on, on the PNC side, oh, yes. um, there are some very direct risks that uh, biodiversity loss presents and, uh, and Jules touched on those from, a, from an agriculture perspective. Obviously, pollination um, services have uh, a, a direct impact on, on agricultural yields and, uh, and that's a class of business that we ensure in the PNC side. But, but 
you know, further down the supply chain, uh, clearly there are potential impacts on, on across the food and beverage industries. And there are lots and lots of areas and sectors of the economy that rely on ecosystem services that a healthy biosphere supports. Um, and we also have we also have a, uh, a, 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 an interaction with the risk through the um, risk prevention specific sort of services that uh, uh, that, that, that nature provides, and uh, and Jules mentioned coral reefs and their um, and their support against coastal erosion, but also things like mangroves can be very um, helpful at uh, at um, uh, alleviating coastal flooding risk. So uh, lots and lots of uh, lots and lots of parts of the uh, of the economy are are, are affected by uh, uh, by by the biodiversity loss. Mm, okay. Okay. So if we compare uh, PNC and, uh, and life, can we say that uh, PNC are more exposed than life? Uh, at least on, on the life side, uh, <laughs> I don't know if Paul wants to jump, but uh, I would have a tendency that uh, maybe probably PNC, yeah, go ahead. Maybe. Paul, can you I, I, answer I, the I, question? We, we've talked about the difficulty in quantification of, 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 of risk already, and I think that uh, um, yeah, the, the, they're both exposed. I think PNC is probably more more obvious, but you know, you know, with pandemics, um, uh, you know, this it's you know, the, it's very very difficult to, mm -hmm. to, 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 to 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 you know balance the two the two. I think they're they're different risks. I mean, it's possibly more obviously directly affecting PNC. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, Michel, can you tell us what's the current approach uh, of the financial sector and more precisely investors when considering uh, biodiversity? So, I, I've, already, uh, I've already talked a little about uh, the tools that we have and the challenges. I think that as French investors, we are quite lucky to have uh, a very stringent regulation that puts biodiversity at the center of our investment decisions. It's something brand new, but since uh, March 2021, we need to have policies and processes uh, to, uh, to manage biodiversity risk. We also need to, uh, uh, to implement a strategy to align with international objectives. So it's at early stage, of course, because uh, nobody really knows uh, how to do it. But having this uh, in, in the agenda in France already in force and having the European agenda with uh, the taxonomy that is uh, already in force for climate change, but still under development for the other um, environmental objectives, this will provide us with a regulatory landscape which is strongly supportive. So what investors are doing is already joining coalitions, for instance, the Finance for Biodiversity Foundation, working together to try and define methodologies to apply to their portfolios, but also gathering information to engage collectively with investees. That's the most important part, and it's the same as for climate change. The objective of climate change is not to decarbonate portfolios, it's to decrease the GHG in the atmosphere. And here again, the objective is not to protect our portfolios against the, uh, the risk of biodiversity loss, it's to use our power as investors to make sure that we change uh, business practices, uh, to make sure that companies better consider biodiversity loss in their business model. Okay. And that's exactly what those coalitions of investors are trying to do. We have something which is called Climate Action 100 Plus. The simili uh, a similar group is being um, created, uh, Nature Action 100 Plus, and, and the objective is to identify at least the first 100 companies that are involved in biodiversity loss and uh, constitute groups that will engage with these companies to make sure that finally we change the business models. You're perfect, Michel. You already answered to my next question. Oh, I'm sorry. Without <laughs> <laughs> and about uh, the part of your mission, of course, as a reinsurer, is to convince also the professional, your, your uh, clients, that the question is fundamental, is a key issue for them, and that is not a, 
it's not uh, it's not an easy job so you you answer also the, the question but like all the systemic uh, uh, risk uh, biodiversity risk is difficult to ensure because of its cascading uh, effect so you you mentioned that also already can we talk about uh, non inserability paul maybe paul can answer the question sure i think i think that um but for, for a risk to be insurable, there has to be an insurable interest. And one of the challenges that with, with biodiversity is very often um, very often finding finding the stakeholder that has the insurable interest in it is um, is difficult because the, the ecosystem services are often public goods that are, that, that many, many stakeholders um, rely on. So yeah, you know, there there are some there are some some particular challenges in actually designing insurance products that uh, that that speak directly to the um, to the to the, the stakeholder groups that um, that that stand to lose uh, in a in a in a you know and, and suffer loss and damage um, and that would need to be recompensed so you know I think it's not impossible there are examples of innovation that that, that are happening already but it's challenging to to construct insurance solutions that um, that that directly protect um, biodiversity mm. interesting so i heard that we have another question from the audience oh let's uh, let's read it the, the biodiversity challenges and measurement issues are clear and michelle are share her views on the asset side on the balance sheet, but can the speaker share any real world example of how reinsurers have altered their underwriting approach to reflect biodiversity risk? Uh, I, I, I have uh, some examples in the in the agricultural underwriting oh. side. Um, so, for example, in in the uh, forestry insurance, our, our underwriters. Will only uh, will only look to ensure um, FSC certified um, forestry uh, operations. So you know that's uh, uh, that's looking to to to, to um, sustainable practices of, around forestry uh, forestry management um, is a good example. Okay. Okay. Good. So to finish, maybe uh, uh, in an optimistic uh, perspective, what are the, the most important next step that uh, the insurance uh, uh, industry can take? Uh, yeah. So um, from a PNC side, I think it's um, I think it's important that we consider the environmental impact of the companies that um, that we insure, including um, including bio. Diversity, and that can be that can be incorporated. Those considerations can be incorporated into our underwriting guidelines. I, I mentioned that uh, that uh, developing insurance solutions is, is is difficult, but there's there's you know, there are certainly opportunities to develop solutions um, around green infrastructure and other nature-based solutions. Um, and I think you know in, critically important because of the role that climate change has. On aggravating biodiversity loss, I think that uh, that there's a there's a lot we can do to um, uh, to, to slow down climate change, um, while taking care to avoid solutions that impact biodiversity. Okay, and Michelle, what about your maybe your sector? The biodiversity journey has already started for investors, so it's not a question of next steps, it's really a question of accelerating where we are, uh, making sure that those various initiatives, again, Nature Action uh, 100 plus, but also the TNFD, the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosures, uh, come out as soon as possible to support our journey. Um, we need to be better, uh, to harmonize better what we're going to do on, on deforestation, which is the first topic, but we also need to open the water uh, problematic, the plastic matters, all of these topics that have impact on biodiversity. We are lot to have committed to reverse biodiversity loss by 2030, so we need to operationalize it. 
Uh, and I hope that the uh, European Green Taxonomy will help us better assess and get the data that is currently missing for us to be much more impactful. Mm. We have also a, a good question from the audience. Uh, as all life uh, depends on, uh, on water, can this one element metric be used for a biodiversity index? You want to go on. <laughs> um, yes, uh, of course, I think that biodiversity, uh, water can be used and is already used as, as an index, um, looking at uh, the flow, the quality, uh, the distribution of water uh, on Earth is really important to understand how uh, biodiversity is thriving or not. But um, it's always the same problem. At the same time, uh, water cannot be the single index index to talk about biodiversity because we also need to have um, some living soils to, uh, to have a, a thriving biodiversity. So, um, so yes, water should be included uh, into, these, uh, into these metrics, but not only. This is the challenge. Okay, so thank you, thank you very much. This uh, live session is uh, now uh, over. Uh, I thank you all, all of you warmly for your participation. Thank you, thank you very much, Paul, Bruno, Michel, Jules. Thank you uh, to all your guests and hope to seeing you uh, at our next SCORE live session. Bye, thank you.